Hi, I'm Madonna. <laughs> I guess you know when you're in love when you finally decide that you want to make sacrifices for somebody else or you want to give something up for somebody else. Or you don't just concentrate on yourself. I think like the love that parents have for their children. Dad! Madonna, I think it's time we get going here. Get going where, Dad? We gotta go. We got some homework to do and things to do. Dad, I graduated from high school. But you're pretending. Twelve years ago. Pretending what? You're pretending that you're a movie star and you're really not. I am a movie star. Once, once we got older and and um, and uh, we could drive ourselves. We, my, my father, um, my parents would go to the earlier mass and we'd say we're gonna go to the later one. We'd all get in the car together and we'd go down to the donut shop and then we'd go to church and pick up like a flyer like we'd been there, you know, and uh, we'd make up something that the priest said during the sermon. And I think my father knew all along that we were lying. Well, I don't think she lied to me, but she didn't oh, always yeah, give you're me the lying full right truth. Now. <laughs> she probably did. I probably Most he, kids did. He's so loyal, he won't say anything bad about me. <laughs> the thing is, if my father hadn't been strict, I wouldn't be who I am today. And I think, um, um, I think that his strictness taught me a certain amount of discipline that has helped me in my life and in my career and also um, made me work harder for things, whether that's acceptance or um, the privilege to do something. My nickname in, in, in my family was the mouth. When there is a big, when you're, in, when you're from a big family, everybody's really competitive with each other. So um, aside from just screaming really loud and doing things that got me attention like, oh, Oh, you know, we would all get in various kinds of trouble to get my father's attention and then um, be punished accordingly. But I think uh, I was really competitive in school with my grades and stuff. My father used to um, give us rewards if we got A's, like all A's on our report cards. And so it was my, my goal to get the best report cards all the time. It wasn't so much that I was interested in learning. It was more that I was interested in getting the best grades and, you know, getting the most. My father gave us... 25 cents for every A that we got. So um, I wanted to earn the most amount of money. I wanted to be the envy of my brothers and sisters. Well, everyone in the family um, studied a musical instrument. My father was really big on that. Somehow, I only took about a year and a half of piano lessons, and I convinced my father to let me take dancing lessons instead. Mm. So I escaped the dreariness of piano lessons every day, which I despised. So. Um, but there was always music in our house, either practicing or records or the radio or someone singing in the bathtub or noise, lots of noise. This last one, Express Yourself, I've had the most amount of input. I oversaw everything, the building of the set, everyone's costume. I had meetings with makeup and hair and the cinematographer and, you know, everybody. Casting, finding the right cat, just every aspect. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like making a little movie. We basically sat down and just threw out every idea we could possibly conceive of. Mm -hmm. And of all the things we wanted, all the imagery we wanted, and I had a few set ideas. For instance, the cat. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea of Metropolis. I was, a, you know, definitely wanted to have that, that influence, that look on all the men, the workers, so. sort of diligently, methodically working away. Um, David, David's idea for the cat to like lick the milk and then pour it over. Sense. It's great. And believe me, I, I mean, I have to, um, I fought him on that. I didn't want to do it. I thought, oh, it's just so over the top and silly and kind of cliche, like art, art student or film student kind of mm. trick, you know, but I'm glad that I gave in to him. The ultimate thing behind the song is that if you don't express yourself, if you don't say what you want, then you're not going to get it. And in, a, in, a, in effect, you are chained down by your inability to say what you feel or go after what you want. Lots of times, Pat Leonard will come up with um, a piece of music like, Oh, Father, we did very little to change it musically. And he throws the music at me, and I just listen to it over and over again. And, and somehow, the music suggests words to me, and I just, just start writing the words down. Mm -hmm. Other times, I will come to Pat with a... A, an idea for a song either lyrically or emotionally and say let's do something like this or I'll have a melody line in my head which I will sing to him 
and he will sort of pound out the chords too. I mean, it, it takes a, long, a lot longer to do it that way because I don't play an instrument, but ultimately it's, it's a lot more personal. And then Steve Bray, it's the same thing. Sometimes he'll come up with a track and he'll have a verse and a chorus, but he won't have a bridge, so we'll write the bridge musically together. I think that, um, you know, Prince was a very isolated life, and I don't, and that is the big difference yeah. between us, and I just try to be a positive influence on him. I've always been a fan. I think he's incredible, and I also admire his... He's very courageous, and he um, causes lots of controversy, too, which is great, and I think he is a brilliant musician. Uh, and... We'd gotten together a couple of times, you know, in the hopes of working with each other in, in some way. Either originally we were going to do a musical together and we were going to write the music for it, and that didn't really pan out. You know what I mean? We just kept getting together, and he, I, he seemed to fight the idea of just writing songs for a record together because he's done that with so many people. He came to see me in the play I did last summer in New York, and he just, for the hell of it, put together a tape of some rough things that, that we had done in all of our meetings that we had. And Love Song was one of the songs, and I just said, you know, this is crazy. It's such a great song. Why, why not put it on the record? And um, it seemed to relate to all the other songs because it's about a relationship that, that's, you know, a hate-love relationship. And so he agreed to it, and we kind of sent the tapes back and forth to each other, and we'd keep building it. It was like he would write a sentence, and... I would add on to it and then send it back to him and he would continue the story, you know, basically. It was fun. Because in this song, really, it was only my musical influence. And his, like, I didn't have Pat or Steve's help. I played the keyboards myself and, um, and, uh, it, because I know, don't know that much, it kind of came out yeah. strange and interesting. It was about innocence versus decadence, really. And in yeah. the end, I chose innocence. I mean, that's what the child represented. You know, it's the childlike quality that everybody has versus the, all the people in the club who, you know, sort of were jaded and decadent and depraved. You know, the other side of life that I'm interested yeah. in. My first boyfriend was when I was, I guess, gee, I think 14 or 15, I fell in love with a boy named Russell. He was the only boy who would dance with me at school because I was really wild at, at the high school dances. And, um... I danced completely insanely, and every, all the guys were afraid to ask me to dance with them because I basically ignored them anyway. Mm -hmm. So, um, but Russell was a wild dancer, and he was a couple years older, so he was more sophisticated. And um, so he was, uh, he was the one who had the courage, really. So he won my heart because he wasn't afraid of me. I can't remember what I saw first, Elton John or David Bowie, but I was, I was punished for seeing both of them because... Kobo Arena was a, a really dangerous part of downtown Detroit, and it really wasn't a place for young girls to be going unescorted, which we all were. So, um, so uh, I think I lied to my father and said I was spending the night at my girlfriend's, and then I went off to the concerts, and both times my father called and found that I wasn't there and found out that I'd gone to the concert. And um, I think I got grounded or something, and I had to, like... Like one summer, I wanted to go away to camp or something, and I, I wasn't allowed to because I went to see David Bowie. But they were both, it was worth it. I borrowed a long black, like, velvet cape from my girlfriend. Who knows what I had underneath it? Um, but I made a, a grand entrance, and that, that was the most important thing. I had my own ideas about God, and then I had um, the ideas that I felt were imposed on me. Like, I believe in God. I believe that everything you do comes back to you. I think... I believe in the innate goodness of people and the importance of that. People who are really, if they're really passionate and they really are, have an open mind, and they really watch closely, I think that the video has a very positive message and that they wouldn't find fault with it. The, the passion is, it's, there's something almost sexual about it, really. I mean, if you want to get really psychoanalytical about it. Um, but, you know, the, the, the video was very, um, I, I think it had a very positive message. Right. It was about, it was about um, overcoming racism and overcoming the fear of, of, of telling the truth, of getting, you know, so many people witness crimes and they're, mm -hmm. they're afraid to get involved Absolutely. because it will only bring them trouble. They're afraid to stand out on a limb and stand up for someone else. And I think it had a lot of positive messages. I mean, it's a very taboo subject to have an interracial 
relationship, you know what I mean? Um, and the idea of that kind of joyousness in the church, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it dealt with a lot of taboos, and, um, and it made people afraid. And I think the people who reacted negatively to it were afraid of their own feelings that they have about those issues. I have to listen to um, the criticism that I get when, it's, when they're dealing with my, with my work. And uh, it's beneficial. I, I guess I don't take criticism very well, but it's getting better. And if I do something and everybody, and there's 100 people in the room and 99 people say they liked it, I only remember the one person who didn't like it. They, they called it the Madonna look. Yeah. Um, and I mean, there were thousands of kids across continents dressing like dressing him. Like him. Yeah. Um, did that surprise you? Did it Absolutely. You? I mean, I didn't, you know, the thing that I used to tie in my hair all the time, mm. my hair was really short and it was growing out, so it was bugging me. It was always getting in my face, so I used to take a pair of tights, stockings, tie it around my head. Or, a, you know, it, it was completely absurd to me that everybody wanted to do that. I mean, it was a mistake, really. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and all the bracelets and all the necklaces, a group of my friends, Martin included, we just got on this kick where we would, we started this thing with those rubber bracelets and we would, we had, we literally had a competition to see how many we could get, acquire, and we never took them off. We would take baths in them and mm. everything. And then the layered thing with the crosses kind of was inspired, you know, by the bracelets and... The thing about wearing a rosary around my neck, there was something kind of irreverent and tongue-in-cheek about that because um, it didn't really go with the clothes I was wearing. So um, it just really evolved organically. Well, I mean, you know, there could be some people in the press that sort of called it just the Madonna craze that'll die and go away. Um, well, maybe that fashion went away because you because were I first changed. to kill it. Yeah. Um, but um, well, Madonna, nobody dressed... Madonna didn't go away. Well, that's true, because I'm not an article of clothing. Right. I mean, when you read the press and they, they say things like that, and they're inferring that you're going to go away as well. She'll, you know, she'll be yeah. gone next year, thank God. Yeah. Well, what happens is, is the annoying? press discovers somebody, and, they, <coughs> and they, they, they're, you're fresh and you're something new, and they build you up, and they say, wow, it's great. And then everyone kind of jumps on the bandwagon, and it becomes this kind of mania. And then everyone gets, every, the press gets sort of disgusted with themselves for building it up. They created a Frankenstein, really, and then they want you to go away. And so they imply that not to worry, because she will go away, you know, because then, it gets, then you get larger than life. And I suppose, in a sense, it gets frightening to people to think that you could have that kind of energy and power and stay, you know? Well, not only stay, but, I mean, people scrutinize you in a much different way, but it's also a bachelor look as well. Yeah. I mean, I remember when like the, the first photos came out of, for, for, the, for the Like a Prayer uh, launch and you had the black hair and people going, yeah. God, look at it now, you uh -huh. know? And there'd be debates in clubs and pubs and goodness whether knows Whether I should be blonde or brown. Yeah, <laughs> and it really was on, you know? Well, the thing is, I, I, I wouldn't even be blonde now except that I'm doing Dick Tracy and yeah. I had to dye my hair blonde, but I, I was, I begged. I begged Warren Beatty to let me have dark hair because it took me so long to grow my hair out and I really wanted to have dark hair. I felt like I was, you know, along with the album, which was much more personal and stuff, I, I felt kind of great um, having my own hair color for the first time in years. There was something exotic to me about having dark hair versus blonde hair and then I had to change it so it was a little bit, I had a bit of an identity crisis because that's the the avenue I was going down, and then all of a sudden I had to change it, so. Women with blonde hair are perceived as much more sexual and much more um, kind of impulsive, not so serious, fun, fun-loving, you know what I mean? But not as, not as layered, not as deep, not as serious. I really want to be recognized as an actress. I've learned that, that if you surround yourself with a, you know, great writers and great actors, and a great director and a great um, costume or whatever, that it's pretty hard to go wrong. And in the past, I've been in, the, in a really big hurry to make movies, you know what I mean? And I haven't kind of taken the time to make sure that all of those elements were in line and, wow. and good and now. And uh, if Warren's taught me anything, it's that, and that is to be patient and only, it's a waste of time to do something mediocre. 
that unless you absolutely believe in it 100% in every aspect that you shouldn't waste your time. I don't take drugs myself. Um, um, I've experimented, but they just don't do anything for me. My imagination and my energy level is um, overdeveloped as far as I'm concerned. I don't want to deaden it, and I don't want to make it something different. I don't need, to, I don't want to alter my state of mind, but um, I know that lots of people have, are very creative if they're smoking grass or, um, or have been, you know, or dropping acid or something. I don't understand that because it doesn't work for me. Um, obviously, I'm not condoning, a, you know, someone to uh, take drugs, you know. And I've watched a lot of people kill themselves taking drugs, um, it's, whether it's heroin or coke, ruin their, their careers, their lives, their, their families, their relationships. I think ultimately drugs destroy, destroy you. They take away your natural ability to be creative or um, love yourself. Uh, deal with people, communicate, whatever. And it seems maybe in the beginning that they help that, that they aid it, that they enhance it, but ultimately they destroy it. Right. So I think it's better just to uh, um, not take drugs. <sighs> there's a lot of terrible things happening in the world today, and there's a lot of people that need our help, and there's a lot of environmental issues that need to be dealt with. But um, in terms of, you know, AIDS, I've just, I've just known so many people that have died of AIDS and it's such a serious problem and like so much, so much of the art community in New York, you know what I mean? I, I feel like in five years from now all, all of my friends will be dead in a, in a way um, and it really hits home with me, it's a, it's a very serious matter. And then the Brazilian rainforest, like I said, the night of the um, performance, the, uh, the benefit performance, I didn't think that it was such a, a personal issue for me. I didn't think it was a, such a big deal until I got all the facts about it, you know. And it really is, I mean, more than, you know, the threat of a nuclear war, which may or may not happen. You know, if we destroy the rainforest, we are destroying ourselves, and it's happening right now. And um, in, you know, in 50 years, the entire rainforest will be gone, and we need, you know, we need the rainforest for oxygen. We need the rainforest to... Um, absorb the carbon dioxide that goes into the atmosphere from all the cars sure. and all the pollution. And we need the forest to um, help find cures for AIDS and cancer, which is an important issue for me. Um, my mother died of cancer. My best friend died of AIDS. So um, it's a really, you know, vital, important <coughs> issue. Anything else I'd like to say? Um, I don't know. Peace. Peace, man. Make love, not war. That's Thanks. all. Dad! <laughs>